settle two to four quadrillion dollars a year. Did you say quadrillion? The US quadrillion. Quadrillion. That's right. <laughs> That's right, guys, quadrillions. In this video, we're gonna talk about this number, quadrillions, and why I think that Link is the biggest opportunity to come to you ever since Bitcoin. What I thought was really important and noticed in the last video I made, if you haven't checked it out from last week, go check it out, is that we need to get into the economics. How do I defend the ridiculous price point of $1,000 per link that I, that I pointed out to you? And how does a chain link token link economics actually work? So in this video, guys, I'm gonna summarize this incredible interview. It's quite long, uh, but I do suggest that you go check it out. But we're gonna talk about the interview with Bankless and Sergey, and we're also gonna go down into the chain link 2.0 economics and what happens with the circulating supply, the fully diluted valuation, and just how the value accrual happens with the link token. And uh, if that sounds good to you guys, make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you're not already. My name is Kyle Chasse. I've been in crypto for 12 years. And like the video, if you haven't already, guys, let's get into it. So, oh, the lights are falling down. Okay, so next video, we're gonna go into a couple clips, guys, and I'm gonna talk about each of them, and then we're gonna go into, uh, into the meat of this, the meat and potatoes of this thing. It's one, one no, singular absolutely network. not. I, we do not have a single network that will not scale, and that's not secure. And uh, the, the people that build single, you know, I, I, I hope we'll have time to talk about the five levels of cross-chain security. Well, I'll explain the different types of networks you can build. But, but no, Chainlink is, thou, is at over a, a thousand Oracle networks. And if you count the staging, the test net, some of the private instances, it's thousands of Oracle networks. And each Oracle network has a specific function, has yes. a specific set of inputs and a specific set of computation inputs and a specific set of computation outputs. It, it's, a, it's a way to create focused validator sets that are focused on generating a specific you could call it a decentralized service. So just like you have centralized web services, Chainlink is the way to create decentralized services. And so guys, this is talking about the fact that uh, Chainlink, this is, this is what I was trying to talk about in the last video as well, is that there's a unique opportunity here. And this is why in the title, I said that this is the biggest opportunity since Bitcoin. Bitcoin is Bitcoin and there's nothing else that can compete with it. It is the de facto, store of value now has become digital gold. I wish that we had the big block debate uh, and it had turned out differently and we had uh, a peer-to-peer -peer digital cash that Satoshi wanted, but at least we got secure, um, you know, decentralized gold out of the whole thing. But the point is that nobody can take that place. It is cemented and, 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 the, and there's no competition for it, right? Whereas alt layer ones, your favorite blockchain that you're bullish on, that's not Ethereum, whether it's Solana, Aptos, Sui, Avalanche, Near, Algorand, Cardano, Poker, whatever. There's a lot of competition in the space. With this, what, Sir, what Sergey and Chainlink are building is this, uh, is, is this decentralized Oracle service or these networks, and they're the only ones doing this, and they have a huge, massive head start. They have essentially built a monopoly on this space and have integrated, they're the, by far the furthest along and only ones right now integrating with major banks, financial institutions, and we'll get into that in just a minute, but it is such a unique opportunity where people don't even realize how big this can be. And that's why I say this is like getting in Bitcoin super early. This is just a narrative that almost nobody understands really, um, at least not on the large scale. And the, the value surely has not been reflected of that yet. Uh, what the D, uh, the DTCC actually is and what possibilities there are in working with kind of that data set or that institution and, uh, and, and blockchain and crypto. What, why is that interesting to us and why is that important? Sure. So the DTCC is the clearing and settlement of the United States, which is the largest uh, the clearing and settlement system of the securities industry. So like all the equities, you know, all these types of uh, stocks, all these things are cleared and settled through the DTCC, and that is mandated by law. So they are the, the legally mandated clearing and settlement system of the United States. And in that sense, they are, if not directly, in a certain way managed or, or controlled by the, by the U.S. government. Uh, they are kind of like the Fed of the securities industry. Mm. They settle two to four quadrillion dollars a year. Did you say quadrillion? US, quadrillion. Quadrillion. That's right. That's, that's what I'm talking about. This is, this is what people need to understand. I'm not talking about another trillion. I'm talking about quadrillions in transactional throughput that could touch our industry 
if we are able to create the security and reliability and unique properties that our industry can create. And it, it, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It doesn't matter if it comes from an asset manager or a crypto wallet or a bank. Everybody will be on a single global internet of contracts, just like everybody is on a single global internet. And the sooner we get there, the sooner our industry will grow. And that's, that's what this is about. It's, it's, uh... So basically what he's saying here is that every single institution, every bank, every pension fund, everything will have their own blockchains that need to be connected. And uh, keep this in mind for when we progress into the video here. Uh, DTCC is just uh, America's clearing and settlement solution. Uh, it is the, the one prescribed by America that has to be the, the one that everybody uses. But remember, America is one of many, many countries in the world. What is it, like 200 countries? But more importantly, you've got other large countries. Uh, and we'll talk about this in just a bit and why this is significant, especially if you watched the first video into some of the financial analysis that we've made. And we'll get into how the, uh, the fee structure works in Chainlink in just a bit. We want the whole world to run on blockchains, which means the whole world's value has to go into blockchains, which means banks, asset managers, sovereign wealth funds, family offices, everybody has to be connected to and utilizing blockchains for their favorite flavor of financial products. So this is you know, about as big an opportunity as I can imagine for banks because they're gonna be able to generate huge amounts of assets, put them on chain, and give them to a global market as long as that global market can connect to their chain, which is by the way what CCIP does. <laughs> which is by the way what we're doing. So again, the only complete monopoly on this, right? But this is what I already described to you guys just a second ago. Uh, so let's get into um, this this tweet here by uh, Crypto Goose, and he, he summarizes the entire interview. Uh, go check this out if you guys don't have time to watch the full thing. Uh, but just a couple major points here, right? So Swift is something that they've been working with CCIP already. Five years proof of concept. Swift has been around for 50 years. Swift has more than 11,000 banks using this technology. Swift is the world's largest signing infrastructure to verify transactions between banks. Swift sets messaging standards between banks that transact with each other. So Swift is, and, and this is uh, in this tweet that we'll see in a bit, there's actually interviews of Swift talking about uh, with ANZ Bank, which is a trillion dollar bank in Australia that's already integrating with CCIP as well. They've already used it to, to for asset creation. And this is what Sergey also gets into, that banks love to create financial instruments. They, this is how they make money. This is just like what we're seeing with BlackRock and the, the Bitcoin ETF. That's a brand new financial in instrument. Banks and institutions like to create financial, financial instruments. They like to sell them, and this is how they make money off of it. So he also says that, you know, that uh, Swift is a, is a really old uh, infrastructure, and they don't want to stop using it, right? They, they, it's, it's, too, it's too big of an ask to get these guys to use a brand new infrastructure. Just like the internet wasn't constructed in the most beneficial way, there's, if it could be done all over again, it would be, but there's different layers that keep getting built, built on top of the old legacy infrastructure because it's just too embedded in the technology to change out the entire thing. They just need to build different scaling solutions on top of it. And this is what CCIP is doing to Swift. Really, really, really huge, guys. Um, CCIP's goal is to become the largest single global liquidity layer across all public and private blockchains. This quote and the next one are the main highlights to me. What uh, we want the whole world to run on blockchains, which means the whole world's value has to go in the blockchain. And you might say, like, yeah, that's what you want, Sergey and Chainlink, but is that what's actually going to happen? Well, yes, it will, because right now it's just a very slow, inefficient financial system, right? When and this is what you know, what Ripple and XRP, by the way, we're going to do a big video on that soon too. But that's what they're trying to solve as well is improving the existing legacy financial system. Um, so let me know in the comments below, guys, if you're excited for an XRP video and how that might be similar or different or competing with CCIP. Uh, I'm really excited to make this video for you guys. But CCP, CCIP's goal is to be the largest single global liquidity layer across all public and private blockchains, guys. That's absolutely massive. So uh, just a real quick, uh, just the most important part. Many people are about to realize that Chainlink operates on a completely different level to anyone in the industry, including your favorite blockchain. Uh, Sergey has been here since 2010. You know, he's been super integrated in, in the industry and um, has been an innovator the entire time. Chainlink has, you know, was, was, was invented, I think, 2014 or something like that, 15, uh, and really is 
like I said, a complete monopoly. This is why it is this it, it, this narrative that I'm putting out there as like the biggest opportunity since Bitcoin or Ethereum essentially now is Chainlink hands down without a doubt. Except for Ethereum has competition, Bitcoin has no competition, and so far from what I've seen, Chainlink has no competition either. So you can see that uh, on the Chainlink ecosystems website, you have DT DTCC, which we've talked about before. This is the quadrillions coming into this, where two points. 1.7 quadrillion, uh, or something like that we'll see here, 2.37 quadrillion in 2021 uh, was transfer transferred on DTCC. So uh, we'll get into, the again, the, the revenue model here in just a minute and why that's significant. Uh, you can also see that the this is the tweet I talked about too, where you can see that the ANZ Bank and SWIFT are talking to each other here about CCIP and tokenization. And we also see things like Larry Fink talking about token tokenization a lot recently. Um, and then we've got here the uh, the link serving as a universal gas token. Now this is just uh, a nice catchy kind of thing that they've come up with um, in the Chainlink community to describe how the value works. And essentially uh, what they'll be doing is, is you, if you wanna use a Chainlink service, you can just pay in link for all your services, gas and everything uh, with account abstraction, which I talk about a lot on this channel. Uh, they're gonna make it so anyone who wants to use Chainlink services only has to pay with link and we'll get into that so and gas will be included back end costs will be included in that just link one token to use for everything all the time for your services for your gas for everything it is the universal token to be used in the ecosystem so like any other currency so so there is staking there is proof uh, essentially a proof of stake or a proof of validation thing here um, we'll get into that in a bit as well but uh like how does a currency a currency has s essentially a pretty quick um, a, a pretty quick uh, velocity of money, right? So you want, in most token economic models, you want velocity of money to be very slow. You want people to hold on to something and keep it. That way the circulating supply gets reduced. But in this, you have uh, essentially a, a universal currency. And so the more people around the world that are using smart contracts and blockchains that need chain link services, the oracles, the VRF, uh, the proof of reserves, the CCIP, they will need to hold link in their wallets and just the sheer amount of adoption makes it a currency. And that's what they mean by universal gas token. So I'm very, very bullish on, you know, even seeing Chainlink used to pay for, like, because it will be eventually when we have, and remember this, everything I'm doing is, this is a high conviction play for me on a hundred X or more over the next six years, right? By 2030, I'm saying $1,000 link. And this is all building up to that, right? Because again, there's no competition. If you're in crypto, if you're bullish on crypto and blockchain as an industry, Web3, then you believe that the world is gonna run on chain and there's gonna be thousands of different chains out there and they're all gonna be connected through one thing and that is Chainlink CCIP, not to mention the whole plethora of other services that Chainlink provides. So this is yeah, the universal gas token. We just talked about that. now. What I want to point out here is this, right? And so the question is, is, is that there is also a bit of FUD or people talking about the fact that people can use something else other than Link to pay for their services. So this is a good, a good thread I found um, from uh, Max Bro. It says, okay, Link thread incoming. So yesterday someone was fudding one of my threads about this new post by Link about the universal gas token. FUD was basically how does that conversion from X token to Link token happen? Uh, does it get market bought from an exchange, from AMM, uh, like SushiSwap? Do they specifically say that anywhere or are they doing private OTC over the counter deals for their own coffers uh, basically to dump on more retail? So uh, I did some digging into the documents and found that Chainlink doesn't actually uh, explicitly say yet how this conversion will happen. Uh, Docs only really mentioned that CCIP supports fee payments in Link and in alternative assets, which currently include blockchain native gas tokens and their ERC-20 wrapped version. So he's not talking about, I, I did see someone talk about, oh, are they gonna be accepting any shit meme coin? And no, they're saying right now that it will be a, any any chain that, that Link runs on. So right now it's like Arbitrum, Optimism, Polygon, Binance, et cetera, et cetera. They'll be using their native gas token or Link. However, there will be a 10% premium uh, on anything paid, on all the fees that are paid not using Link. So there's people are highly incentivized because if you're paying and you're transacting a lot of value. Oh, I'm getting bit by mosquitoes here, guys. <laughs> Crazy. Um, I'm in, yeah, in a very mosquito place. Um, and it looks beautiful, but uh, yeah, anyway. So, uh, 
Oh, they drive me crazy. Uh, smash the likes if you guys hate mosquitoes. Uh, I actually hate them. It's the one thing that I don't mind just killing for sure. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, uh, yeah, so w the point I want to mention here is this, right? Um, so, well, let me, let me finish this actually. So luckily, uh, luckily, Let's Go was, uh, was hosting a space with some big hitters where they talked about, uh, directly about this. Uh, Catfishy Fish says, gave us another article that talked a little bit more in depth about this. Um, so we are so we are working on a on a so we are working on an automated on-chain conversion mechanism where fee payments made in alternative assets are auto converted into link. This means that if I pay in BNB, if I pay in ETH, if I pay in Optimism, that that is going to be converted into link, which means buy pressure, which means buy pressure. Now, even if that was OTC, which it's not going to be because this is fully automated, right? So the thing is, and I'll get, I'll show you some really funny fud in a second. Um, but the thing is, Sergey is obviously a huge believer in decentralization. It's, it's, the, it's the core emphasis and ethos of everything he eats and breathes and lives. And so there's no way that they're gonna be doing anything not automated on chain. All of this stuff will happen autonomously on chain, full transparency for everybody to see. It's not going into Sergey's pocket, right? The guy's already, look how I got like bit like three or four times right here, it's insane. Uh, he doesn't need any more money, guys. Like, if you think that he needs to build, and plus it's just, it's just ridiculous. So anything that happens that's not in link will be uh, converted into chain link. So it's like the same thing, right? Um, but people will be, like I said before, people will be holding large amounts of link in the reserves to automate their protocols. So whenever they need to do something, call an Oracle, use CCIP, use VRF, use uh, whatever. Every time they need to use a chain link service, they will have to use some link tokens and that they will have to have that in a gas tank essentially so the whole process can be automated. This is the future of crypto, guys. This is where we're headed. Autonomous, on-chain, fully transferable, fully permissionless, fully open, uh, and, and account abstraction. So this whole thing is made super easy for everybody. Here's a flywheel, um, and this is what, what Sergey talked about. So as the and he talks about this a lot in, in, in different interviews. Um, as the economic secure, the cryptographic economic security improves, so does the value proposition to different banks. If we can prove that proof of reserves exist, if we can prove that the transfer, and, and you need this to be strongly secured by validators. So here's the economic flywheel. Increasing user fees from smart contracts, greater cryptographic economic security, chain link networks, uh, economies of scale, increased demand for Oracle services, and on the greater, the greater wheel, you see chain link network growth is growing smart contract demand because, it's, because there'll be more security and more reason for people to want to use it. Now here's where some FUD came in. Uh, I thought it was pretty funny. Here, uh, Jack of the Oasis uh, made this whole thing of just talking crap. Uh, Sergey's link wallets printed from thin air uh, up here, and then uh, he says, it, you know, used to pay diverse uh, human resources and community advocates for shilling, essentially. Link dumped on Marines and Sergey and Chris's lifestyles. So this is like, um, this is absolutely absurd. Like I, I guess I said, I, I already told you why it's absurd. Uh, I don't even need to go into it. And, and one of the things I want to talk about here is the 55% of Link is in circulation. There's still 45% that is not yet in circulation, which could potentially lead to enormous inflation, right? And this is, this is concerning. This is the biggest elephant in the room, so let's address it. But uh, what Sergey has talked about in this interview and other interviews is as the value and of the revenue increases from people actually using the services, and remember, this is all very, very early days, right? DC, DTCC is just in the intent stage. It's not even officially done, but they intend to use it, and when it integrates, fees will kick in, and those fees will be enormous, right? Same thing with SWIFT and other institutions and other partners that they're using. So the revenue is, is minuscule right now, so they still need to take that, I believe it was 35% for rewards for validators, and that is currently causing some inflation into the market, which, you know, of course, de devalues every single link that's in the market. But, um, but this is important here. Well, uh, as Chainlink launches more and more services for more and more and more and more users grow uh, on more and more chains, the protocol revenue will continue to grow, which allows the node subsidies to taper down towards zero. So when the revenue gets to a point to where it is sustainable, uh, where the, the, the economic reward can be, uh, you know, incentivizing enough, like right now it's 4.75% for staking your link, you're getting 4.75% in passive revenue right here. Um, but eventually that, that is coming from inflation, right? It's not the best, 
but we will see that that, that tapers down as real world revenue starts to come on chain. And, uh, and yeah, also guys, there's other cool things too, like the build program, it's three to 7% of everything that they're incubating, goes back to stakers as well, which increases revenue. This is just a crazy revenue machine. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about guys is I asked, you know, we, we made, again, go check out the first video if you haven't seen it yet. I get into all the data and, and the calculations of why I think that Chainlink will hit $1,000. Um, but that was just for kind of one, one thing by 2030. Let's, let's look a little bit further. And because Chainlink is so, initial, so, so uniquely positioned, uh, so monopolistic uh, in a way right now with, with its, where, where it is, but the most important thing, it, it is monopolistic. And while historically that has been a bad thing because it eliminates competition, uh, decentralization is all about creating the, 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 the best service with the best economic model and the best value proposition, proposition wins. It just wins, right? And, uh, and, that's, and that's essentially what they're going for. They have an opportunity here to be massive, right? Why would Sergey do anything to jeopardize that? So they're going to create the best economic model, the best incentives. Um, and once they prove, like the DTCC is the largest clearinghouse essentially in the entire world, but there's other ones, right? So I, I asked ChatGPT here, and this is where I want you to go. The, our numbers before were based on Swift's projections, uh, not even DTCC. And that, the numbers I, I made before were uh, in the part of the document where they talk about that. Uh, let me see if I could find it again real quick. This is quite important here. So fee payment premiums for CCP, CCIP messaging will be a flat fee per message, while fees for using CCIP to enable token transfers will be a percentage of the value transferred. Okay, so now I was talking about this with my team earlier, and we were talking about, uh, you know, it says that for value transferred, it will be a percentage of the token value transfer. Now, the only way for people like Swift to increase the efficiency of their network is to tokenize the value that's being transferred back and forth. So you will have like JP Morgan stablecoin, you'll have Chase stablecoin, you'll have you know HSBC stablecoin, you'll have Bank of Japan stablecoin, and they will all be settling on Swift's network in stablecoin, not in the current you know ways that they settle right now. And the, that is tokens. And so the the assumption that we made in the last video was just using a percentage of Swift's volume going through CCIP and a percentage of that uh, volume, which is just said here, is, is how they charge revenue to make those calculations earlier. Now, that wasn't even including DTCC, and I wanted to extrapolate that even further and say, okay, well, if DTCC is successful, every other country in the world is probably going to adopt it as well for their same clearing and settlement solutions. Why? Because it's, it's agnostic. It's not political. It is decentralized. Chainlink is an American. They aren't European. They aren't Asian. They aren't their global decentralized network. And so there's no political problem here with integration, right? Like there is in, in American companies or Chinese companies and sanctions and blah, 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 blah. This is the beauty of blockchain and decentralization. It's market neutral. It's political, political, politically, blah, <laughs> politically neutral. And that gives the perfect reason for anybody to want to adopt this technology versus trying to build it themselves and compete with each other. This is totally neutral. So look at United States, China, Japan, they all have their own versions of DTCC. And I wasn't able to find the value of this. I know it's significantly less than the United States, but if the United States is doing, the DTCC is doing $2.37 trillion, a, uh, quadrillion dollars a year, you have to imagine that the rest of these guys are also you know, getting into the multi-trillions or hundreds of trillions or even aggregate more quadrillions of dollars every single year that will probably come online within the next five to 10 years, guys. So when it comes to risk reward, Right now, there's literally nothing, not Bitcoin, not Ethereum, not nothing that I'm more bullish on than Link. And I hope that between last video and this video, you guys understand why. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. I'll catch you guys.